Good morning. Welcome everyone to this morning's webinar. I'm Tom Alston and I have Keith and Ryan Swirsky from GKG Law ready to go. This is their, this is the beginning slide. What you see is the beginning slide of their uh, PowerPoint. But first, I'm going to play a video for you. Welcome to another Aero Marine free webinar. Let me tell you who we are. We help people who are buying aircraft, vessels, and vehicles to legally avoid the California tax. Just because you're a non-resident of California doesn't mean you're not subject to their assessment. So be smart about all of that. This is We do these for you because we're trying to give you free information. We do this all the time because you need it, because you've asked for it. And if you've got any subjects that you'd like us to cover that you haven't heard us cover in the past, just send me an email or call us at 916-691-9192 and we'll get you the information that you asked for. Okay, there's our little bit of promo, and I'm now going to turn this uh, webinar over to uh, the, the Swirsky dad and son. And uh, don't forget to unmute your audio, both of you, and uh, let's go. It's all yours. Thanks, Tom. No uh, welcome, everyone. This is Keith Swirsky. I'm president of GKG Law. Um, I will also, let me see, advance this slide here. Okay, I also have just a little bit of promo. Um, GKG Law started in aviation 60 years ago. Uh, we grew to about 25 aviation professionals and uh, our practice was in scheduled air service. We did some ad hoc corporate aircraft deals for many, many years, but I founded the corporate aircraft practice group in 1990. Uh, before that, in the, in the 80s, I did mergers and acquisitions, corporate law, tax law, and securities work. Uh, at this time, I have handled or supervised over 5,000 transactions. Um, with the breadth and deal volume, that kind of deal volume, and participation at industry events and webinars like this, we've developed long-lasting good relationships and friendships in the industry uh, and when a deal involves advisors that we know well, the deal always goes smoothly. And that's really, you know, having uh, advisors that know everyone, that know what they're doing, um, like Tom and like our firm, allows for a smooth and efficient transaction. We also uh, put on free webinars, as does Tom, and our webinars are archived on our website at GKG Law. Okay, so today's webinar is on federal tax planning considerations of personal use of corporate aircraft. I'll cover uh, code section 61, uh, which is income inclusion for individuals. Ryan will then cover code section 274, which is limitation on business deductions. And will also reference as applicable any FAA regulatory considerations. Um, as an aside, please type into the chat log any questions that you have while uh, both Ryan and I are presenting, uh, we'd be happy to answer those questions at the time you type them in, if they're germane to the slides we're discussing. Otherwise, we'll discuss them at the time it's appropriate. We'll also take questions at the end of the webinar. Code section 61 provides rules for governing the tax implications for employees. Think of it as two sides of the coin. Code section 61 deals with the tax impact to the individual and the flip side of the coin code section 274 deals with the tax impact to the business entity um, so business use is use in furtherance of business of the employer non-business use is any other use including predominantly you have personal entertainment and uh, recreational and non-entertainment travel by an employee you have travel by an employee in furtherance of another business of the employee um, and you have commuting. Those are all of the non-business uses of an aircraft that result in income inclusion potential. All right. So you have two rules. You have the IRS rule and you have an FAA rule. 
The IRS rule is that you, an employee must reimburse the company for non-business transportation or the company must impute fringe benefit income to the employee for the value of that transportation. However, when aircraft are operated under FAR Part 91, the FAA general rule is that the company cannot accept reimbursement from the employee. So that's one of the two tax possibilities is accepting reimbursement or receiving an imputed fringe benefit. Um, okay, so the, IRS, the FAA says you can't accept the reimbursement. Now, there are three FAA exceptions to that general rule. Uh, one is use, use of a dryly structure, one is use of a timeshare agreement, and one is the Nichols opinion. I'll discuss all three. So the use of a dry lease structure structurally is where the company that is operating the aircraft leases the aircraft without pilots to the employee. Um, there's no limit on the rent that may be charged. The lessee must contract for and pay the pilot, pilot services directly from a source independent of the company. Um, the lessee assumes operational control of the aircraft and therefore is liable for all operations of the aircraft. Dry leases are not subject to, to federal transportation excise tax, and dry leases are generally subject to state use tax. The benefit of using a dry lease in order to allow reimbursement to the company is that you have really an unlimited economic reimbursement. So you can structure whatever you would like in terms of a maximum amount of money, um, which in some circumstances is what you might want to achieve. A timeshare agreement, conversely, has a cap, and we'll get into that. Timeshare agreements are very common. Um, a timeshare agreement is essentially a lease. However, it's not a dry lease like the first uh, exception that I just discussed. This is a wet lease. And this is where the company leases their plane with flight crew to the employee. Uh, and charges that are permitted under a timeshare agreement are strictly governed by the FAA. In a timeshare agreement, the company retains operational control. Accordingly, the employee doesn't have operational liability, and that's a big benefit of a timeshare agreement. Um, a timeshare agreement, however, is subject to federal transportation excise tax. So any amount that the employee pays to the company is subject to a 7.5% FET. Timeshare agreements are not subject to sales and use tax, generally speaking, as well. Um, so this slide shows you the maximum amount that can be charged under a timeshare agreement. Uh, you look at the list, you see the first item is um, travel expenses of the crew, or actually the first item is, is fuel, and that's under the, the first carrot there. Um, so you have 200% of the cost of fuel, and that is pretty much the lion's share. When you look at those other items, uh, crew travel expenses, hangar tie down costs, um, landing fees, food and beverages, you know, fuel will, will ultimately be 95% of the hourly rate at the end of the day. So when you look at your actual fuel cost, that's what the FAA is looking at, and you're doubling that. You're permitted to double it. So, your timeshare agreement. What, what you need to understand is it's not required that you pay the maximum amount. The FAA doesn't mandate that. This is a cap. So you can charge less than the maximum amount from an FAA perspective. You would have uh, tax considerations in analyzing how much you want to charge, potentially SEC considerations on reporting aggregate incremental cost for, public, for reporting companies, for uh, named executive officers. Um, and those kinds of items would factor into what you choose to charge, but this is a list of the maximum you can charge. Um, a timeshare agreement is, as I said, very prevalent, particularly in publicly traded companies. Uh, we also see it in closely held companies where people have uh, friends, colleagues, relatives that they'd like to have use the aircraft. A timeshare agreement is an easy turnkey way of allowing you to charge those people. Uh, the FAA, uh, this is the third uh, method of charging. The FAA uh, has for a long time or had for a long time prohibited charges of any kind for a company transporting a guest. When a, the Schraub opinion, which was issued in 1999, held that when an employee uses an aircraft for personal purposes for a fringe benefit, 
that employee's a guest. And the FAA concluded that that guest, that employee, may not reimburse the company because it didn't meet the requirements of 91501B5. Um, so forever, we had this uh, Schwab opinion that held that uh, an employee who's using the aircraft for personal purposes could not reimburse, and that's the basic rule. Um, in 2012, the, the FAA um, liberalized that rule somewhat by modifying the Schwab opinion and indicating that a company can charge an employee a pro rata share of the cost of owning, operating, and maintaining the aircraft. Note, that's a pretty big number, a pro rata share of the cost of owning, operating, and maintaining the aircraft for employees such as the CEO when the CEO's job merits uh, substantial interference um, in their vacation plans and their personal travel plans. So in other words, if the company has a policy that they can interrupt the executive's personal travel, we call them to a business trip uh, right in the middle of a personal trip, then they would meet the requirements of the Nichols opinion. The company retains operational control, so that's a good thing. Uh, whatever is paid by the executive is subject to federal transportation excise tax. And the company must create and update a list of individuals whose positions with the company require him and her to routinely change travel plans quickly. Um, despite the fact that the Nichols opinion came out in 2012, I haven't had a client, to my knowledge, adopt the Nichols opinion approach. Um, I think the timeshare agreement is a fairly straightforward methodology, and frankly, the maximum amount permitted under a timeshare agreement is generally sufficient for all companies that would like to charge their senior executives for personal use of the company aircraft. So where does that lead us? In order to comply with both the IRS rule and the FAA rule, the company's only options are, one, to impute. So impute means phantom income on the executive's W-2 or 1099, or to utilize one of these three exceptions, the dry lease, the timeshare agreement, or the Nichols opinion. All right, so you have those options. For uh, determining the amount of income to include when you're going to impute, there are two methods that are prescribed by Code Section 61. One is the general rule, which is the fair charter value method, which I'll get into, and the other is the standard industry fair level method, otherwise known as CIFL. CIFL is an acronym that many people have heard. CIFL is the preferred methodology uh, because it results in a very low amount. I'll get into how that's calculated in a minute. But suffice to say that of the literally thousands of clients that I have, uh, I have no knowledge of anybody using the fair charter value methodology. Um, only the civil methodology. All right, so um, the fair charter value methodology is the value of personal travel uh, equal to the arm's length cost to charter a similar aircraft. So what we're talking about is in your geographic region of the United States, you determine what, uh, what charter companies are charging in that region for a comparable aircraft. So if you have, for example, a Gulfstream 550, you look to see what the charter rates are for a Gulfstream 550 plus fuel surcharge, et cetera, et cetera, to determine what is a fair market value for that aircraft. You allocate the fair market charter value among all of the employees on the aircraft, unless some of the employees have the ability to control the use of the aircraft, which is the common situation. Usually uh, you have a senior executive on board the plane who's booked the personal use travel. That individual is the only one who's invited guests. So typically you'd impute the entire um, fair market value to that senior executive. If a company chooses to use the fair market value methodology for a flight, then they'd use that methodology for all flights during the year in general. Okay, there is a consistency rule under Code Section 61, which says once a company adopts a methodology, they have to stay with that methodology for the whole year. But there is an exception to that rule that says if the company has adopted a CIFL methodology for the year, and they'd like to adopt a fair market value methodology for persons. 
specified individuals. Ryan will define specified individuals in his presentation. The company can use the fair market value methodology for specified individuals while using the CIFL methodology for all other individuals. Um, again, that's a detail which I have no clients that are using two different methods. I have no clients that they know that are using the fair market value methodology. And that's because the CIFL methodology results in a very low valuation. So let's talk about that. Uh, CIFL is a simple mathematical formula that factors in the status of an employee as a control employee or a non-control employee, the number of family members, guests accompanying the employee, the weight class of the aircraft, the distance from, and it's applied separately to each employee on each flight. Uh, except you'd ignore intermediate flights unrelated to personal purposes. So if you had three people on board, for example, and the plane had an intermediate stop to let off one passenger, um, the other two passengers that uh, didn't get off and had no interest in the stop, you would not, you'd va value the entire flight assuming there was no stop for those two passengers. Um, I have a question. Um, let me uh, read it out loud. Uh, it's a long one. My wife and I are owners of an LLC that has owned four aircraft since 2014, each a 1031 exchange, current market value 250000 dry lease to the two of us, and I am the pilot. The aircraft historically has been used 75% business and now 70% depreciated. We are self-employed. This is a complex question. All right. This goes on and on and on. Um, let me get into this. Uh, I encourage a person who wrote this question to, to call me after because this is a long question that will take a little bit of time to get into and it would be uh, a side track. Um, this is a question, can CPAs receive CPE for this webinar? Um, that's a question for uh, Tom to answer. I'm, I'm not in a position to know that. So. Uh, Tom, if you'll let the author of this question, can CPAs receive CP for the webinar, let that person know after the webinar. That would be great. Um, let me continue on. And again, I will answer that complex question, whoever wrote that uh, later. All right. So um, the CIFL formula also includes a cents per mile rate and a terminal charge that are adjusted and published semi-annually by the USDOT. The CIFL rates are republished by the IRS. All right. Um, so here are the CIFL rates for the last half of 2019. We do not have the CIFL rates for the first half of 2020 at this time. Um, we they, they lag. So um, but so how this works is if you have a flight, say, under 500 miles, 490 miles, it would be 23.22 cents per mile. If the flight is 750 miles, you'd use 23.22 cents for the first 500 miles and then 17.71 cents for the next 250 miles, and so on and so forth. And you have a terminal charge per passenger. So that's how that works. Um, this is the weight class schedule. So you look at the, M, uh, the maximum gross takeoff weight of your aircraft. Let's say we're talking about a Gulfstream 550. That's going to be in the 25,001 MGTOW or greater class. Um, all executive officers who have the ability con to control scheduling on a personal use flight would be control employees. So they would be in the 400% multiple because of the weight class. You know, you, you look at, and if it was say a 450 mile flight, you have 23.22 cents per mile times 450 miles. Then you multiply that times four because we're, we're flying on a Gulfstream 550, and that would be your um, your CIFL amount, and then you'd add the terminal charge to that, okay? And that's your CIFL per employee, uh, or per passenger, pardon me, per passenger on board the plane. Okay, so where a flight is provided to uh, an employee to a particular destination for a combination of personal and business purposes, you only impute income if the personal purpose of the flight is primary. That's a subjective determination, okay? Um, you, the company uh, has to assess, and the, generally speaking, the executive is going to tell the company 
the, the, um, the personal purpose was not primary. You'd expect that to be the answer. Um, and, you know, but there has to be some, uh, shall I say, objective analysis applied. I mean, somebody needs to look at the way the executive completes the trip sheet, describes the purpose of flight, and identifies it as a business use when there are also personal purposes involved. Um, you know, you'd look at the facts and circumstances, how many days, uh, were, you know, was the, was the executive at the destination location? Did the executive take his or her spouse and family members and friends? Um, was the business meeting only a couple of hours? And then there was three days of non-business activities. I mean, you look at the facts and circumstances and try and reach a reasonable conclusion. Okay. Um, when you have a mixed business and personal trip. So uh, what I just said a moment ago is a single destination for both business and personal purposes, the primary purpose controls. But if you have a single trip with both business and personal destinations, um, you determine the primary purpose of the trip as a whole. All right, so we're talking about the plane goes from its hangar, point A, to a business meeting location, point B, to a personal location, point C, and then return to the hangar, point A. And you have to look at the primary purpose of the trip as a whole. So what I'd say is if the, uh, the, the destination C was scheduled first, and that was your personal destination, and then the business destination B was added on later, you probably have enough facts to conclude that the primary purpose was personal. And I'd say conversely, if the business destination B was scheduled first and C was added later, you may have enough to say the primary purpose was business. Uh, but, you know, you could be overwhelmed by facts. Uh, the business location could be a three-hour meeting and the, at B, and then C could be a one-week vacation. Um, and you'd probably have facts that overwhelm that, and now you really have a primary purpose being the vacation. Um, so you have to reach a conclusion what the primary purpose was. If you conclude that the primary purpose was business, then you have a very favorable formula. The amount you impute for the miles is only equal to the actual miles flown in excess of the miles of the hypothetical trip to the business location. So in other words, you calculate the hypothetical trip from A to B and B to A. You look at those total miles and only the excess actual miles flown over the hypothetical miles would be what you impute. Conversely, if your primary purpose is personal, you actually just look at your hypothetical round trip miles from A to C and C to A, and those are the miles for CIFL. Okay. All right, so this is a completely different topic, the seating capacity rule. The seating capacity rule says if you have at least 50% of the regular seating capacity on the aircraft filled with passengers traveling for business purposes, um, and that, by the way, that does not need to be all employees. It would just be passengers traveling for business purposes. And you add spouses or additional employees or dependents of anybody on board that aircraft traveling for business purposes, the CIFL value for those guests is zero. Um, and if you put non-employees on board the plane, the CIFL value is at the non-control employee rate. If you remember that chart that I had up a few minutes ago, the non-control employee rate is roughly one-tenth of the control employee rate. So it's a big, big savings. So the seating capacity rule is advantageous if you can meet the facts of the seating capacity rule. Um, Okay, if an employee utilizes one of the exceptions to the FAA general rule to permit an employee to reimburse the company, and if the reimbursement amount is less than the amount that otherwise ha would have been imputed under the fringe benefit rule, then the employer must impute the difference. So what I'm saying is let's say you use a timeshare agreement and you charge under the timeshare agreement an amount of $2,000 an hour. And under CIFL, you, let's say you had 10 people on board, and the CIFL calculation is $3,500 an hour. In that case, you still have a delta of $1,500 an hour, and you must impute to the employee that delta of $1,500 an hour. And as I said, the foregoing is most likely to occur in situations 
where all or nearly all of the seats of the aircraft are occupied. So because when all or nearly all of the seats on the aircraft are occupied, you end up with a very high CIFL calculation because remember CIFL is per person. So you calculate the CIFL amount for every passenger on board the plane. And you would in many circumstances exceed what you charge under a timeshare agreement. You would not likely exceed what you charge under a dry lease or what you charge under the Nichols opinion, but you'd likely exceed what you charge under a timeshare agreement. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, there is one more question. Uh, will the slides be available for download after? And I believe the answer to that question is yes. These slides will be made available to all participants by Tom. Um, so next up is Ryan Swirsky. Ryan is an associate in the corporate aircraft group at our law firm. He practices in the tax area and frankly all aspects of purchase and sale of corporate aircraft as everyone does in our corporate aircraft group. Ryan, you're up. Thank you, Keith. So Keith did a great job uh, talking about one side of the coin, which was the uh, income inclusion to the individual. Now we're going to talk about the consequences to the company. So the code section here is section 274. This limits the ability to take deductions for expenses of facilities, uh, which an aircraft is, uh, used for entertainment, amusement, or recreational purposes and commuting. Uh, with commuting, uh, there is an exception if it's necessary to ensure the safety of the employee. I'll get into that a little later in the presentation. So this does uh, encompass the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Previously, business entertainment uh, was deductible. Now, no enter all entertainment is going to be disallowed, whether it's business or personal. And the same goes for commuting. It's not going to be deductible, except to ensure the safety of the employee. So a business aircraft, uh, with this, this law is going to apply to specified individuals. Um, this is different from control employee. I'll get into the definition on the next slide. Uh, but basically, a specified individual is going to be someone with the ability to control use of the plane. So code section 274 requires that expenses, and this does include depreciation, be allocated to your business travel and your disallowed uses on a pro rata basis. And it will deny or limit your deductions for the expenses that are disallowed. So under the new tax law, if you take, you can take 100% bonus depreciation on new and used aircraft, consider the effect that a lot of disallowed use could have in the year you place your aircraft in the service um, and you have 100% depreciated and then you have a portion of that disallowed, it could be a significant effect and you'll want to be cognizant of your disallowed uses, uh, particularly in the year you take your bonus depreciation. Who is a specified individual? This includes all officers, directors, and persons directly or indirectly owning more than 10% of any equity class of the taxpayer. Uh, for purposes of this, this will include your spouse or family members or guests. Uh, note this is different from control employee, which uh, has a 5% number. And this is going to apply to your privately held companies, publicly held companies, partnerships, and tax exempt entities. Okay, what is entertainment? So the definition of entertainment uh, in the tax code is, is not very helpful. It's uh, an activity generally considered to constitute entertainment, amusement, or recreation. So you have a circular definition. Entertainment is things that people think are entertainment. Fortunately, we have some examples of activities that would constitute entertainment, such as sporting events, hunting, fishing, golf, going to nightclubs, country clubs, skiing, resort type destinations. Uh, there's also specific examples um, such as sailing, sightseeing, going to the Super Bowl or the Kentucky Derby or going to parties. Uh, and it's important to note that 
it's the activity at the destination that is looked at. So if you conduct business on your flight to go golfing, uh, that doesn't turn golfing into business just because you conducted business meetings on the aircraft. Uh, it's the activity at the destination. And further, it, it wouldn't matter if you individually don't like golf and don't consider it to be entertainment. That's irrelevant uh, to the determination. You're looking at the activity. And if it's considered generally considered to be entertainment, then it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. So what activities are personal but wouldn't be entertainment? So commuting, this is its own category, but it's largely considered the same um, for tax purposes here. Um, and I'll get into that more later. Travel to a funeral, that's certainly not entertainment. Travel for medical purposes, uh, travel for charity work, travel for business other than that of the employer providing the flight, that's a big one. Keith touched on this earlier. A lot of our clients and people who um, fly on private aircraft have multiple businesses. You're looking at the um, the employer, and if it's business for a different company, that's going to be considered uh, personal, not entertainment use uh, in this case. Also, travel to meetings with personal advisors. Uh, think your accountants and lawyers, uh, financial advisors. Transportation between homes, not associated with entertainment. Uh, so this is not going to be, if you have a home in the Bahamas or uh, a, even a home in Florida, you know, in Miami or something, uh, those could be associated with entertainment. So, um, they won't necessarily be entertainment, but they're going to be uh, scrutinized a little bit closer. Uh, one important thing to note is that this is um, the determination of whether it's entertainment or not is on a passenger by passenger basis. So, for example, say you have a CEO and his family uh, going skiing and the CEO works the whole time or skis. Uh, can everyone hear me? I got a comment that someone cannot hear the sound. Okay. Um, so take the example where you're going skiing and the family goes skiing and the CEO does not. The CEO may not be entertainment. It may be business while the family members would be considered entertainment. Ryan, there is a question about whether this is being recorded, uh, and the answer is yes, this is being recorded. Um, I believe the audio and video will be made available to everyone, and uh, if you have further questions, you could reach out to Ryan or I uh, from the author of that question. Sorry, Ryan, go ahead. No problem. Uh, oh, going back to this, uh, I also want to point out that uh, just because you have facts that may look bad, uh, so you're flying to a resort type destination uh, it's over a weekend or near a holiday um, doesn't necessarily per se make it uh, personal or entertainment, but those flights are going to be scrutinized closer. And it is the burden on the taxpayer to show that they are entitled to the deduction and that uh, if you can't show that, then the IRS can actually recategorize the flight as, as non-deductible. So uh, when you do have bad facts, make sure you keep additional records, uh, such as Keith was mentioning that maybe any business activity was planned before personal activity and things like that. Okay, so when you have both business and recreational purposes in a single destination, the final regulations don't actually address how to determine whether a specified individual's trip to a particular destination uh, should be categorized when both activities are conducted. Um, but Keith talk, talked about uh, the primary purpose and other regulations that govern the imputation of fringe benefits 
and, and income imputed to employee. Uh, in the absence of guidance, it's reasonable to assume that you can use a similar, similar methodology here. So when a flight uh, provided to a specified individual includes one or more destinations uh, for business purposes and one or more destinations for entertainment, you're going to, um, this, is, this is essentially what Keith was talking about earlier. You're going to take the hypothetical flight as if, well, first you're going to determine whether the primary purpose is business or personal. Let's say it, the primary purpose is business. You're going to take the hypothetical uh, flight as if only the business destinations occurred, and then you're going to take the actual flight and the excess is going to be allocated to the entertainment. And you would do the inverse calculation uh, if you determined that the primary purpose was personal, you would look at the hypothetical personal flight, and then the total flight and the excess would be allocated to business. Okay, so the types of expenses that are subject to 274 disallowance are very broad. Uh, this includes all your fixed and direct expenses of operating and maintaining the aircraft during the taxable year. So these are things such as fuel, landing fees, overnight hangar fees, catering, uh, per diem for the crew, management fees if your aircraft's managed, hangar rent, salaries of the pilots. Uh, but it's very broad and it's also going to include other types of expenses such as lease payments if you're leasing your aircraft, charter fees if you're chartering your aircraft, tax depreciation, this is a big one, and interest properly allocable to an aircraft under the interest tracing rules. Okay, so uh, I mentioned earlier, consider the effect of a disallowed use when you are taking bonus depreciation. Uh, so there are special rules regarding depreciation expenses, expenses specifically for disallowance uh, that can sometimes result in a more favorable calculation. The taxpayer can elect to calculate depreciation using the alternative depreciation schedule straight line method over the class life of the aircraft solely for purposes of calculating the disallowed expense, even if you're using another method such as bonus depreciation uh, for tax or book purposes. However, this election uh, is, has to be made for all your aircraft that you own. Uh, so you can apply it to aircraft placed in service in prior years, but if you have multiple aircraft, you're going to need to run the calculations to see what the net tax um, effect is because it's not always clear cut that it could be a benefit. So uh, if you do make this election, you apply the straight line to the original basis as if the election had been effect since the aircraft was placed in service. So um, you may end up taking uh, a disallowed off of a smaller percentage than 100 if you do this and that can be beneficial. However, you do need to run the calculations to make sure. So actually calculating the uh, disallowed amount, there are four methodologies to do this. The passenger by passenger method by seat hours, passenger by passenger for seat miles, flight by flight for seat hours, and flight by flight for seat miles. Uh, generally speaking, if you have more passengers on your disallowed flights, such as your entertainment flights, the flight by flight method is going to be more favorable. You can use any one of these four methods. Uh, so uh, we recommend running all four and determining uh, which calculation has the best tax effect for you and using that method. To illustrate how these can be different, let's take a hypothetical where you have 10 flights between point A and B. And nine of those flights are business flights and only have one passenger on them. And the 10th flight 
is an entertainment flight and it has nine people on it. Well, under the passenger by passenger method, you would have nine out of 18 total passengers be business. So 50% would be uh, disallowed use. Whereas with the flight by flight method, nine of those flights were business and one was personal. So only 10% are gonna be disallowed uh, so you can see 50% versus 10% as a significant difference uh, based on which formula you use. So again, we stress calculating all the different methods and determining which one is the best. So for personal use of your aircraft uh, for the passenger by passenger method, you're going to want to have to keep, uh, you're going to want to allocate into five different buckets here. The, so you're gonna keep your records of all your aircraft expenses and the total flight hours or miles by each individual passenger. And you're gonna categorize them uh, into one of these five buckets. And these buckets encompass both sides of the coin, uh, income, inclusion, and uh, disallowance to the business. So if you have business non-entertainment, you are not going to have imputed income and you're not going to have disallowance. For business entertainment, you will not have imputed income, but you will have a disallowance. For personal non-entertainment, you will have imputed income, but you will not have a disallowance. For personal entertainment and commuting uh, without a security study, you will have imputed income and you will have disallowance. And then lastly, commuting with a security study, um, you do not have a disallowance. You are able to deduct. Uh, the rules that govern the security study are in uh, the regulations 1.132-5M. I'm not gonna get into those requirements, um, but if you do have a, a bona fide security study, you can deduct in that instance. Uh, there will be imputed income, but the rules for calculating it uh, in this instance are slightly different. So this is an example of the types of um, records you'd want to keep if you were doing uh, passenger by passenger with a, on a seat miles basis. Assume five passengers are on board, all specified individuals. Three are business non-entertainment. One is entertainment or commuting without a security study, and one is personal non-entertainment. The trip is 1,000 miles. So you'd keep track of the passengers, the total miles, and you'd total up the seat miles for your records. And then at the end of the tax year, you would take all of your occupied seat miles or hours if you're using the hours methodology in all your buckets, in this instance three, and you would take the sum of all expenses subject to disallowance and divide them by the total sum of the occupied seat miles or hours in all your buckets. Then the average cost per mile, occupied seat mile or hour for the taxable year will be determined from that and you will multiply the average cost per mile or hour by the total number of occupied seat miles or hours for a given entertainment flight and that will determine the expenses associated with the uh, entertainment flight. So allocating expenses, um, the total amount imputed as income to or reimbursed by the specified individual. Sorry, do I have a question? Uh, no, okay. The total amount imputed as income or reimbursed by the specified individual for each individual entertainment flight, not to exceed the total entertainment expenses with that flight, will be subtracted from the entertainment expenses and that will determine your disallowed amount. Okay, so at audit, the IRS may assume that all aircraft use is personal and entertainment, thus disallowed unless the taxpayer proves otherwise. This isn't like criminal law. It's not innocent until proven guilty. The burden is on the taxpayer to substantiate their deductions. 
And the types of records you're going to want to keep to substantiate, um, you're going to want those deductions are going to be all your aircraft expenses, the departure airport, the destination airport, the total number of flight hours and statute miles flown during each flight leg flown for each individual passenger on each leg, uh, the passenger's name, airport, destination airport, and purpose for traveling to the destination, whether it's business, whether it's personal non-entertainment, entertainment. And you're going to want to uh, keep track of whether each employee is a specified individual or control employee, if applicable. And these records should be kept um, contemporaneously uh, with the flight. Records created after the fact are going to be less persuasive. Uh, Self-serving records in an audit uh, may be more scrutinized. And so you're going to want to have an employee assigned to collect all this information. And this employee should be someone who's comfortable uh, questioning the nature of travel with a senior executive. Um, so sometimes that employees may not feel comfortable. You're going to want to have someone who feels okay asking, is this flight personal? Is this flight for business? Okay, that is the end of the presentation. Let me see if there's any questions. I don't see any additional questions. Okay, um, so Keith just said that his software's not working, so uh, I will conclude. I wanna thank everyone for attending this presentation. Uh, if you have any other questions, our contact information is on this slide. These slides will be sent out. Um, Tom? So, Ryan, can you hear me? Yes. All right. I want to thank everyone that attended this webinar. It was one of the best attended that we've had in a long time. I want to thank Ryan and Keith for working through the little technical glitches we had. We had one person who said that they couldn't hear it. Uh, but uh, uh, remember that if you have a sound issue, we're also recording this, and the recording will be posted on our website as soon as we can get it up and you will be sent a link to it so you won't miss anything and you'll be able to view it multiple times. I want to personally thank both Keith and Ryan for the excellent job that they did. It's a huge, huge subject and trying to, you know, bring that down to a level that everyone can understand with the limited amount of time available. So on the screen right now, you've got their phone numbers. If you've got questions, including the one that was asked that had a lot of details on it, please call Keith or Ryan and get your questions answered. Uh, now everybody is, now everybody can hear us and we're going to sign off. So thank you a lot again to Keith and Ryan. You guys did an excellent job and we'll love to have you back.